So um, I'm currently based at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, and um, this is going to be the presentation. Largely, it's based on the work of my graduate student, um, Samita Somatilaka, and the title of their presentation is Role of Molecular Communications in Multi-Species Human Gut Bacterium. Um, I'm actually going to go beyond the gut bacterium towards the latter part of the presentation, talking a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing in biofilm, but how uh, certain elements of that can actually be used um, in the future for the gut bacterium as well. So um, what I'm going to actually do is start with a very um, brief introduction on the, the human gut bacterium, looking at some of the things that we've been doing about developing an in silico simulation model of a virtual gut bacterium. And the whole idea here is to actually understand the impact of the various different types of inputs into the actual system and how that can actually vary based on multi-species communication um, that occurs and how we might be able to, let's say, analyze changes as they're actually propagating molecules from one species to another. So the way we will actually look at that is a, through a two-layered molecular communication system. And we will analyze one specific type of molecule. Um, it's short-chain fatty acid. Um, um, the reason for that is because of the commonality of the metabolic processes between those cells. I'll explain a little bit more about that. And based on that, I'll, I'll discuss a little bit about you know, cooperative amplifications that can actually happen between all these different multiple species as they're actually propagating information through the network. Um, lastly, I'm going to touch on a, a new research that we've been trying to look at most recently is on the area of non-neural organisms and how we can look at bacteria as a non-neural organism. So when we look at the, um, the human gut bacterium, it's actually pretty much a very, very complex um, uh, environment that's consisting of multiple different types of species. The bacterium essentially is a sub uh, structure of the here the, of the um, entire microbiome that we actually have within the actual gut itself. When we actually consider the microbiome, we're actually considering various other different types of bacteria as well as organisms within it. But when we talk about uh, a subset of, let's say, um, certain genuses of bacterial species, we will just concentrate on the, the gut bacterial. And that is actually, you know, very much, pretty much vital to the, the human health. Many have actually referred to the gut as the actual second brain, especially when we actually talk about the gut-brain axis and how molecular communication within the actual gut bacterium can actually affect a lot of the signaling that actually goes up to the brain, whether it's through the circulatory system or even through the nervous system. So this phenomenal amount of actual production of different forms of molecules will only concentrate on the short-chain fatty acid, right? And it's actually a major factor that decides various different types of functionalities, as I mentioned earlier, not only to the actual brain itself, but also to various different types of um, um, other organs. And they can actually be largely affected by different types of inputs. First and primarily is the actual dietary patterns that we actually take in. Medications obviously plays a big role. And of course, communication between the different types of cells. And especially when you actually have an imbalance between the different population sizes, right? And this, of course, leads to various different types of um, uh, diseases, such as inflammatory bowel disease, type 2 diabetes, and even cancer as well. There's actually been linked to how that can actually be affected by the human gut bacterium, as well as even other types of neurological diseases that most recently people have actually started to discover, such as Alzheimer's. So what we've been looking at is, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a human gut bacterium in silico simulation model of a two-layered model where we use molecular communications and graph theory in that. So if we were to actually look at, say, this is only a very quick snapshot of the different types of bacteria we have within the actual gut itself. And um, you can see the various different types of species that's there. This is only a very, very small number out of the large number, but I would say the most let's say distinct numbers that we might have that actually plays a major role. And what we've actually done here is that um, we've organized and looked at how we can actually determine how we can create a network of multi-species characterization uh, of the way they actually communicate. And the way we actually did that was pretty much take out a lot of the actual bacterial cells that actually have a common um, ancestral origin um, that is actually belonging to the same genus. So 
research has been shown that when they're all the different cells actually belong to the actual same genus, they actually have the very, very much the same metabolic ac activities. So the minute that you actually input a certain types of molecules or um, into each one of those species, all the same re relevant species within the same genus will actually pretty much have the same reaction. And this is the actual main reason we've actually concentrated on short chain fatty acid, because we know that let's say, for example, short-chain fatty acid comes along and then is being absorbed by EU bacteria, and we know that all the other EU bacteria species will also have the same metabolic reaction and produce the subsequent short-chain fatty acids to all the other cells itself. Right. So what we've actually done here is that we've actually taken um, real sample data from the microbiome database, amongst a few other databases that you can actually see here. And what we've done is that you can actually see right at the bottom there from the 360 or so um, samples that we've taken, you can see the different um, ratios of population sizes of each of the actual different species. So what we did, as I mentioned in the last slide, we take all the different species and we pretty much group them up into different genuses. And you can see a list of these common genuses for all those different species. And so that each of these genuses will have a collection of different species that will pretty much react and react um, equally as soon as, let's say, the molecules actually, um, uh, uh, you know, they actually get absorbed into that. So based on this, you can see that what we did was taking the actual relative abundance of all these different um, uh, population species sizes, we took an average of them, which is Pretty much, it does fluctuate obviously between different um, you know, individuals, but on average, this could actually be a representation of the relative abundance between the different um, genuses that you can see. So you can see this network structure that we constructed using this real um, uh, data that we got. And then based on any inputs that we have going in, we will only focus on glucose we can see that each of these um, different genuses of the layers will actually produce molecules that will actually flow onto the following species, right? So obviously here you can see that the large amount and the, the, the biggest would actually be the acrobacterial um, um, genus there. So what we did here was that we constructed a two-layered model that you can actually see that I mentioned earlier. So at the very top layer is based on the genus relationships between the different um, uh, uh, groupings of bacterial species that will actually represent each one of these nodes. And once they actually then produce molecules, in this case, a short-chain fatty acid, we then come down to looking at the molecular communication behavior based on diffusion as these molecules are actually propagating from one genus to another genus. So obviously when they actually get um, um, absorbed in, they will actually go through an uh, uh, internal reaction process and then in turn actually produce molecules as an output to that. So it pretty much mimics like a very large um, parallel processing process that actually occurs, very complex system. We, we also short, it shows um, short-chain fatty acid based on the fact that a lot of these molecules don't react with each other, although they can actually react with other types of molecules within the environment um, that can actually impact and degrade that. We haven't actually considered that. We considered the more stable short-chain fatty acid that will actually get transferred from, let's say, one genus to another type of genus. Right? So what is actually very, very interesting, and you can actually see it in this diagram, is that when the actual um, input of glucose actually comes in, you actually get a, a memory effect that actually occurs within the environment, which we are all very familiar, occurs a lot within molecular communication channels. But what was actually interesting is that when you actually have, say, for example, in a first lot of um, genuses that you can see here, six different types of them, they'll actually produce different molecules that actually gets output out of them and they'll be absorbed by other um, bacterial population in the second layer. So you can see here, say for example, out of let's say the most common 10 that we've been talking about before when we constructed our network, you can have let's say six of them actually producing acetate, um, four might actually produce propionate and you might have two that actually just let's say produce lactate. And you can see here that based on the different amounts of actual glucose inputs, each of them will actually produce a pulse of different amount that actually comes out. Now, the amount of molecule that then resides within the environment is highly dependent on 
uh, the, 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 the population, the relative population size within the bacterium itself. So you might have, say, a high influence from, you know, bifidobacterium or bacterioids, and this would then influence the amount of molecule that actually sits within the actual environment. And of course, as subsequent molecules are actually being produced and input in, that will, of course, create interference between that, which we'll talk a little bit about later. And so this would then basically affect how would that actually get absorbed by the subsequent um, uh, species as they're actually producing molecules that would then be absorbed by the host. So you can see that it's like a cascading molecular communication network that goes from species to species to species. And there's a significant amount of noise that can actually affect the different cell types. You know? So what we did was that we just wanted to analyze and you, we used a little bit of graph theory techniques here to see that, let's say, for example, if we vary certain types of inputs or the structure of the, the network itself, how does that affect the actual molecular production as it goes from species to species? So in this example here, we just, for, for example, vary the different amount of glucose input that we're actually inputting in. And then we wanted to see how does it actually vary? So you can see here that what's actually quite interesting is that if you actually increase the amount of glucose input in from the host itself, it will actually increase, but at a certain level, all the actual six bacteria genuses will actually reach a saturation level. And in certain cases, some may not even be able to take any more. Um, this is also dependent on not only the memory that actually exists and actually affects the molecule production and its effects between each other, but also the size of the population in absorbing that, right? So this can also, you can also see here when we actually compare, say, the end product um, bacterial population here, let's such as EU bacterium, fecal bacterium, and SUR, you can see that it actually varies in the population ratio size depending on the amount of glucose. In certain cases, say for example, Escheria, you can see that it actually saturates. But in case of EU bacterium, you'll actually see an increase dramatically once the um, in, amount of glucose input actually goes in. So you can see that, you know, based on all these variations in the behavior, this can actually affect a lot of the actual health. And this is why maintaining a stable gut microbiome is actually very important there. Um, we also look at variations of other types of inputs beside glucose. We also look at fructose as well. And you can see in the bottom graph there that even if you actually vary the amount of input, it doesn't actually have that much of an impact compared to, say, glucose. So the type of molecules you input really plays a role, how the actual uh, each of the cells will actually uh, perform its metabolic um, reactions in actually producing the molecules for other cells to actually take. Um, what's interesting here was like when we then wanted to see that if we, for example, vary the population sizes of each of these genuses, how that will actually in turn affect the molecular production as it's actually traversing from one genus to another. So you can actually see here that when we actually manipulate certain types of um, population size, let's say for example, in this case, it's bacterioids, it actually has an end result um, of actually producing uneven amount of uh, short chain fatty acids as an output. The highs of course being acetate that's actually being produced, taken up by fecal in bacterium. So you can imagine that say, for example, if we were to manipulate this to produce a set type of um, uh, short chain fatty acid, you can actually achieve this possibly by changing the population ratio within the gut bacterium as well. So um, you can see here as an end product, say for example, looking at the, you know, the propionate, butyrate and acetate, you actually get a linear increase as, as a full output from the total network itself. And this actually linearly increases. But when we look at the Pearson correlation heat map down actually below here, what's, what's actually interesting is that when you look at the relationship here, say for example, with certain types of bacteria like allostate fecal bacterium or parabacterioids, you have a very, very high relationship to say the, the production of butyrate. And so, but when you, let's say, even if, I'm sorry, if you, if you increase ruminococcus there, you won't actually have that much of an effect for the butyrate. This means that you can actually have opportunities of creating programmable ingredients in the future that 
you can actually change, um, uh, modify, uh, personalize to actually each individual. You might, let's say, take fecal samples from them, stick it in this to this virtual simulation, understand how their gut is actually pre um, uh, performing. And if, let's say, certain population size is actually below its optimum level, you might be able to enhance and actually trigger the growth of those population sizes in order to produce an end result of short chain fatty acid that you need to actually personalize the condition of that individual. Okay. Um, so what we also found is that you actually have a lot of, say, um, cooperative amplification obviously happening. So for example, what I showed before in the network structure, we have certain population uh, genuses, like say the six of them that will take, all take glucose and they'll all actually, some will actually produce acetate, others might actually produce um, lactate, but they actually produce that actually um, uh, cooperatively. And what actually happens in certain cases that you have very, very high signal outputs coming out of certain species that will hang in the environment and that will actually then um, lead to actual noise for subsequent molecules production that's actually being produced. So we were looking at the effects that this might have on, say, the intersymbol interference and how, let's say, certain bacteria might actually get affected because of such type of interference. So, so this actually shows uh, a, a quick diagram of what I was actually talking about here just before, when you actually have the six uh, um, genuses that was actually producing all of that, they will actually affect the actual signal, um, uh, the, the mut overall mutual information of the resulting um, uh, bacteria genus in the network, and of course, then the actual host itself. So we were doing an anal analysis of it, looking not only, let, let's say, for example, in each genus being a transmitter or a transmitter receiver, but also, let's say, what if you actually had multiple of them, um, a collection of them in parallel acting as transmitter and receiver, and how that actually impacts on the different types of molecules that are actually propagating between each other. So what we did was that we, we also found real data on this to look at the different genus population sizes between all um, the 10 genus that I was describing before. And we were trying to look at a comparison of what the differences would be between say control or autistic um, human gut bacterium, or even let's say Parkinson's human gut bacterium. And we wanted to see how the information flow would actually be affected in terms of, let's say, measuring the intersymbol interference and the mutual information as they're actually propagating from one, 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 one layer to the next layer. Right? So we were looking at, say, the conditional entropy of the, 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 the middle layer as opposed to the conditional entropy of the actual second layer which will then be affected by the production of, of the molecule signal strength from the, from, from the first layer itself. And we wanted to see the relationship between that. So what we, what we found was actually quite an interesting um, behavior here. You can see right, right at the bottom here, it's basically just looking at say, um, the quantity of the Q is actually the number of different cooperative amplifiers that you can actually have with respect to time and how they're actually actually producing them. So in the actual first case here, you can actually see it's just at the actual transceiver of the first layer, the middle layer, and how it's actually being received as an output at, at the very end there, right? So obviously, so, so if you actually look at the very first graph here, just because you actually have higher number of cooperative amplifier does not necessarily mean that you'll actually lead to a higher number of molecules being produced because it also depends on the other cells and how they're actually going to be absorbing them and how those molecules in the memory might affect the subsequent um, uh, production of molecules. So, so what I also forgot to mention was the way we, we, we did our um, analysis was inputting, let's say, bitstream in, and each of those bitstream might be a certain amount of glucose pulses that we might push in. So let's say it's 0101. Zero, one, zero, one each of those one would be a glucose pulse we actually input into the system and we have a certain time slot to allow the cells to actually produce a short chain fatty acid that the subsequent cells will actually take. Right. So, 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 so we can see here right at the top, if you actually increase the number of um, cooperative amplifier, obviously the intersymbol interference is actually gonna be reduced. The main reason for this is because of the collective absorptions that you will have um, not only because of the glucose, but also the production of the short chain fatty acid and, and trying to actually, you know, ensure that it actually then also leads to a, 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 a stable system. 
So this was the, the, the comparison that we did between say the control, the Parkinson's and the autistic um, human gut bacterial. So if you observe, observe here the, the, the very first layer, each of the circle sizes represents the pop relative population size. So you can see here in the case of, let's say the, the Parkinson's human gut bacterium, or even in the case of the autistic, you'll actually have a smaller population size there. And so this pop smaller population size would actually then result in lower, say, uh, mutual information because of the lower signal strength that's actually propagating onto the actual next layer itself. Although when you actually observe here, what's actually quite interesting is that overall you do get quite a stable equivalent um, mutual information compared to, let's say, the control case. And this could actually be because of, say, the amount of uh, complementary redundant parts of signals that is actually being produced by all the different species. So you might have certain cases of, let's say, small population, but that might be compensated for other population that actually produces a higher one. And of course, the lower number of actual EU bacterium population actually also plays a role in this as well. Um, I would like to touch on this um, learning in the non-neural organisms that I mentioned earlier, which is something that we recently, recently looked at. So it seems to be a, a new thing that is being uh, investigated by synthetic biologists at the moment. So here I've put up some examples of three works that people have been looking at. Um, it's pretty much trying to create biological AI out of um, organisms. So at the very, very top here, is an example of a work that is actually looking only purely at the metabolic circuit and how we can actually create perceptrons out of that. It's actually used based on the different types of enzyme input. You can then have this actually design the circuits to have like a sigmoidal function, just like a typical perceptron you might have in an artificial neural network. And based on the different inputs that comes in reacts, it actually produces an output. Um, this is using a cell-free system, so it, you can essentially have this inside a, an artificial cell, for example, that's very, very trimmed down with only the metabolic circuits inside. Um, and at the bottom there is another example, but this is looking at molecular communication between cell to cell. In particular, they were looking at E. coli, and what they actually did was they... Um, it was actually an offline design of an artificial neural network. They created an artificial neural network, and then once they did that, they will then determine the amount of molecules that will actually be diffused from the, the, the first layer, the input layer, to the, to, the, the, to the next layer, which is actually the bacterial cells itself. So they only looked at a single layer artificial neural network here and was varying the amount of the molecules that you actually flows from the input to the next foot. And that will be equivalent to the weight of, um, of, of signals that's traveling from node to node in the, in the artificial neural network. And they were doing various different types of um, applications for this, such as um, you know, uh, different encoders. Another example is the Percept gene. This was developed at MIT. They actually engineered a circuit um, inside an E. coli, and it's actually based on um, weight chemical input manipulation that they use through a power law function. And through that, they were able to get like a perceptron model uh, like behavior. Um, based on um, input chemicals of IPTG ATC and through Aribanor's um, inputs, it was actually slowing down and you can like, get this sigmoidal-like function out of them. So we, we ourselves, we've also started to look at this as well, but we were looking at it from the natural uh, gene regulatory system that actually occurs inside um, bacterial cells. So when you look at the bacterial cells, um, well, or any other cell as well, when you look at the relationships of gene expression that actually occurs, you have a network structure that pretty much resembles very similar to an artificial neural network. And of course, you'll have weight values between the nodes of these gene expressions. So if one gene is being expressed, molecule is being produced, it diffuses, goes, and it binds onto the next um, part of the actual uh, genome itself to express another set of genes, you'll have that weight relationship now, this weight relationship, you can get this data from transcriptomic data, which is something that we, we, we did ourselves. And you can actually see here that in certain cases, we might even be able to change a lot of this weight as well. It could be through environmental um, impact. In this case, let's say um, temperature between changes of, let's say, 37 to 30 degrees, you can actually change the actual production of those gene expression to the next one there. 
So what we were looking at here was um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. We took some data out from the regular uh, PA database. And you can see on the um, right-hand side here is the two component system gene regulatory network, which is pretty much the top layer of any gene regulatory network once molecules are actually um, approaching and being absorbed by the actual cells itself. Just think of it as the sensory part of the gene regulatory network. And we were able to extract a neural network, a, a one with a single hidden layer from that itself. And so based on that, what we found out is that as you actually have communication one from one cell to another, it actually inputs and changes, uh, modifies the actual computing behavior that the cells actually do. So you get this differences in actual computation that actually occurs as you have a population of cells. And what we've been looking at was using graph neural network because of its um, you know, inherent data structure relationship between nodes, which is like determining how, let's say certain genes expressed will actually express other genes. We were looking at how this gene, uh, the computing behavior actually changes throughout the, the, the whole entire biofilm. So here we did some um, uh, simulation work right at the bottom there. You can see when we actually vary, say, uh, mutations, um, you know, starting with, let's say, a natural case with low or high phosphate, those are actually nutrients for, for the cells itself. And if you actually had different mutation, how this actually affects the production of a particular type of molecule. In this case, we only focus on pyrocyanin. And when we did some comparison to, to wet lab data, and you can see right up here, so our gene regulatory neural network, you can see is actually the blue column and the orange column is the wet lab data. Um, in the case of the wild type, we were able to get quite you know, similar prediction that was actually very close to our neural network. But in other cases, we had a small bit of deviation. And we believe the reason is because we only took a small subset of network of the gene regulatory network. And so we did not consider effects of other gene expression relationships and other part of the gene regulatory network that can impact on that, which is something that we will be looking at in, in, in the future. And this is what I mentioned earlier about the spatial computing. So depending on where the cells are and the molecules they actually produce while they're actually communicating between each other and because of the memory effect that you have, you will see that the parts of computation will actually be different for, for different cells along that. So it's like a massive parallel computing uh, uh, system that you actually have where all of the cells are actually computing all in parallel, all having uh, different relationships between each other. Um, and we can also define and see that you can actually get different phenotype, uh, phenotypic um, clustering dynamics as well. And this can actually change. If you look at the very top graph here based on time, it actually varies and changes. And all of this is because of the different amount of nutrients that flows in and also the communication between the actual different cells itself. And that can actually modify and change all the different computing behavior between the different cells. Um, so that brings me to my conclusion, you know, starting with what I presented early with actually molecular communication in the human gut bacterium, we can see that, you know, by actually defining it as a network of the genuses and looking at molecular communication between the different genuses, we can come up with personalized food or even new types of drug design in the future or even different techniques of actually doing smart um, diagnostics. Um, we can also maybe look at ways that we might be able to rebalance that as well to actually determine the optimum signals that we might want to have actually propagate between the different genuses. And that might be one way for us to actually treat certain types of diseases. And towards the end, I was looking a lot at this, um, talking a lot about the learning and adapting of biological AI with, that we might be able to use in the human gut bacterium to actually restabilize the network itself. Um, so, so that's the end of my presentation. Thank you.